Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here. So my name is Naomi Brockwell. I make educational videos to help people reclaim their privacy online. And I'm really excited to be here at CactusCon. So I just love this year's theme. The tagline is so good. The year is 2024. Surveillance is privacy. Submission is liberation. Control is freedom. It's just so relevant in today's age. So the reference obviously comes from George Orwell's 1984. It's a classic novel. And the world of Big Brother, which is a symbol of excessive surveillance and control, I think is, is really important to just kind of keep in mind during today's talk. So let's start off just by talking about 1984. 1984 is a riveting story and it shows us how a world stripped of privacy can shift the balance of power really far away from the individual. And it shows us how scary this can be. But sometimes literature can be so dramatic that it's hard to relate to it because we fail to recognize the similarities between this author's made up world and our own lives. And indeed, 1984 takes these ideas to the extreme. There's a giant face that is a glaring down at people everywhere they go. And citizens gather in big halls to scream hateful words at a screen as part of their daily activities. And that's not something that we do, except maybe at election time. But my point is that there is this dramatic flair to 1984. And so we might be tempted to dismiss its lessons as pure fiction. But underneath this exaggerated dystopian world that Orwell created, there are some profound lessons about the psychological effects of pervasive surveillance. And I wanted to go into that in today's talk because I think these lessons are extremely relevant to modern society. And before I dive into that, I first want to get a sense of the audience. So who here thinks that privacy is important? Almost everyone, <laughs> noting down the thought crimes of all of you who didn't put your hand up. Who here thinks privacy is dead? Yeah. And who here thinks that we could possibly still save it? All right, that's not bad. That's actually more than I was expecting. Who, all right, let's sw uh, flip it. Who here thinks that we cannot salvage privacy? All right. My job today in today's talk is to try and sell you a, a white pill because um, there are a lot of black pills in this audience, but I do want to let you know that you are more empowered than you realize. I think we have to change course because what's at stake is so important. So it, it is going to be an uphill battle. I know that it's not easy, so I am kind of on the side of everyone here who's like, no, nope, we cannot be saving privacy because it is a giant undertaking, and I, I get that. We're changing culture, we're fighting inertia, we're staying at the cutting edge of technological advancement. Not to mention all the costs of this, right? If you run a business, it costs money, it costs time, it costs resources to integrate privacy measures into your platform. If you're a user, there are convenience costs to choosing privacy. But there are also costs to continuing on our current trajectory of diminishing privacy, and we need to understand that. So it's those costs that I want to focus on in this talk today. So first, I'm going to look at the current state of privacy. I mean, it's not as brutal or harsh as Orwell's 1984, but surveillance today is just as pervasive. And it doesn't matter how palatable or even enjoyable that we've made this surveillance because we're most of the time opting into it, right? We click that little, yeah, I agree button and we get free products and we kind of like it. It seems like a pretty good trade-off to us. But the effects of this surveillance on the fabric of society is just as profound as in something like 1984. And that's worth exploring. And on top of that, we need to make sure that we're fully aware of the consequences of creating a world without privacy. So I want to make sure that we take stock of the kind of future that we're enabling and what's at stake to make sure that we are fully aware of the choices that we are making. And then I want to talk about how everyone in this room can help make sure that the future we create is the best possible timeline, not the worst. The people who attend this conference, you are not your regular passive enjoyer of technology. You have a say in the direction that this technology will take. You guys are helping write its future because you are involved in this industry. So let's be intentional about the kind of future that we want. And I just want to start off with a disclaimer as well. So I am not someone who wants to make people start sacrificing modern conveniences in order to salvage privacy. That's not me at all. When we start talking about privacy, so many people do resort to these straw men and they tell us that, oh, if we want privacy, throw out your digital devices or, you know, you care about privacy? Okay, stop using the internet. 
I mean, that solution is just not good enough. Like probably all the people in this room, I'm a technophile. I adore the internet and uh, I'm always trying out the latest gadgets. So suggesting that people give up technology is just not a reasonable answer. And it's also incredibly outdated. So it's 2024, the technological possibilities around us are incredible. And if we want to reclaim privacy in the digital age, the answer is not to throw out our devices, it's to truly embrace technology and to leverage all of the new cutting edge privacy and encryption technologies that are being developed every single day. So it's up to the technophiles at conferences like these to push these privacy tools forward, not just in their development, but in spreading awareness about their existence. So let's get into the first section, taking stock of the current state of privacy. Pervasive surveillance is a part of our normalized everyday experience. And we don't have like literal telly screens in every room as this ominous reminder that Big Brother is watching our every move. The surveillance in our life is more subtle. And it comes from a mix of companies and governments, and it just kind of fades into the background for most of us. We have devices like Amazon's Alexa and Google's Home constantly listening to our conversations, and we put them in intimate places like our living room and our bedroom. Like, what are we doing? We have major services like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Zoom, Adobe, the list goes on that all harvest significant user data and share it with thousands of entities. Cars these days, they monitor everything we do. It's kind of insane. And people are only just waking up to how many entities this data is shared with. We have comprehensive video coverage of suburban areas thanks to doorbells that we point directly at our neighbor's house across the way. And we point them at public streets and they also capture audio of people's conversations as they pass by on the sidewalk or audio of what you're saying in your living room because they do reach that far. And when there aren't home cameras, there's CCTV, there's facial recognition software, there's tracking via BLE, Wi-Fi be beaconing, RFID. And IoT devices have introduced a cascade of unintended data sharing. Devices often continue to share networks and transmit data even when users think that they're isolated. And then in our pockets. Everywhere we go, we carry cameras, microphones, GPS, you name it. Our phones can tell whom we meet. They can infer what we're doing. They hear what we say. They track not just location, but our online activities. So what we click, what we read, our health data, our financial choices. Then there are the data brokers. These are the digital pack rats of the internet. They are hoarding any scrap of all of this that they can find, and they're selling it to others. And we have no control over who gets access to this data. And some of the largest clients of data brokers are actually governments around the world. But governments also have other ways to collect our information. So let's go into that. In the US, we got a glimpse uh, a decade ago at some of the intelligence programs used to intercept data due to the Snowden revelation. So things like PRISM, which gives government agencies access to servers of major tech companies. There are programs like Tempest, Turbulence, Turmoil. There are indexing and search systems like X-Keyscore. In the UK, they have programs like Tempora, which is a full take data collection program and all traffic entering and leaving servers in the UK is collected. We can presume that we will never know about most intelligence programs or about the data sharing agreements and reciprocal relationships that exist between different governments. Although I'll take a guess that there are probably some people in this room who do know more than others. There are also systematic data collection programs like census data or KYC, mandatory reporting for everything that touches financial payment rails. And we like to think of data collection from private companies as distinct from government entities. But in the modern age, they are inextricably linked. Before the internet, businesses could only collect a very limited amount of data from people. You know, you'd go to your local video rental store and you'd give them your name and telephone number, it'd be stored on their local system. They're not connected to the internet, so it's not going anywhere, it's just sitting there. You know, if a government wanted that data, they'd have to get a subpoena for that specific store to get all that information. Nowadays, businesses collect a constant stream of data about you and they store it in centralized servers and you have no reasonable expectation of privacy for any of this information if it's handed over to such a third party. And this basically gives companies carte blanche to share that information as they choose, even with law enforcement without a warrant if they, if they want to, thanks to the third party doctrine. 
And on top of that, many companies deliberately obscure the specifics of their data collection practices. So they're leaving users in the dark because if users knew the extent of data being collected about them, they might not want to use the product. So the situation as it currently stands is we hand over the intimate details of our lives, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes without explicit understanding of all our actions, and sometimes against our will. And there's a free-for-all with all of this data as companies are breached and it ends up on the dark web or it's purchased or it's siphoned in bulk from various governments uh, around the world. Gosh, let's take stock of all of that. So who's here said that privacy is dead? Yeah, okay, yeah, it, it does seem like that when you kind of just start to look at the specifics. You may be onto something here, but remember I did already acknowledge that this would be an uphill battle. So let's keep going and let's move on to what's at stake here if we don't start to push back against the current trajectory. Pervasive surveillance. Even when it seems non-threatening and comes from the rudimentary tech in our lives has two big consequences that I wanna dive into. First, it shifts the power away from individuals to centralized entities and it potentially jeopardizes future freedoms. And second, constant surveillance has deep psychological effects on society. So let's start with the first implication that constant surveillance potentially puts our future freedom in danger. Now, many people in this room, you're probably comfortable to be here in the USA. You probably think that this is not a risk worth worrying about. Who here is not that worried? Who here is like, eh? No one puts their hand up. This is my kind of crowd, or you're all terrified. Either way, I can work with that. So a lot of people, even if they're not in this room, a lot of people are just trusting that companies are going to do the right thing. They're going to trust their government. They're going to say, well, I like my government, uh, or at least I like the system that's in place that lets me elect a new government if I don't like the current one. You know, I, I think everything's set up pretty well. I don't need to worry. So let's, for argument's sake, Let's not worry about the USA for the time being. Let's just zoom out and we'll focus on authoritarian regimes that use surveillance as a tool of oppression that most people would say, yeah, that's an authoritarian regime. So in North Korea, constant monitoring gives the regime an iron grip on its citizens and it's ubiquitous. In China, a social credit system converges things like financial habits, daily activities, and social graph into centralized metrics that determine whether your children can attend certain schools, whether you're allowed to travel, whether you're allowed to leave your hometown, if you've been well-behaved enough to use the fast train, or if you're allowed to book hotel rooms. In Nigeria, the introduction of a CBDC, or programmable government money, allows lives to be monitored and controlled through financial choices. So it puts the Nigerian government at the center of every transaction so that money can be more easily tracked, frozen, seized, even programmed to be erased if certain spending conditions aren't met. So by looking around the world, we do get a sense of how pervasive surveillance has the potential to be weaponized, at least. So now let's go back to the USA, or Australia, or Switzerland, or insert whatever your favorite country is that you really like and you think it's free and you think there's no risk of anything bad happening. And it doesn't matter if others disagree, just pick something you like. So are we right to dismiss the risks of pervasive surveillance if it's a country we trust? Does the lack of privacy present the same dangers in countries where leaders are democratically elected or where there are fair trials or where we believe that there's less corruption? The volume of data amassed by governments and companies, whether the country is considered more free or less free, is staggering. We only just, you know, looked at the tip of the iceberg there. But surveillance these days is ubiquitous. So the real concern isn't whether data is being collected, it's how it's being utilized. So how is it being utilized? Well, data is used by companies to get us better tools and services, and it's used to help government agencies catch bad guys. And let's again, for the sake of argument, presume that in your country of choice, that, you know, it's very trustworthy and it's very free and these are the only ways that data is being used right now. There is one thing that I want you to take away from this talk today and it's that regimes come and go but your data is forever. Social norms change. Your data is forever. So there is no telling how the information collected about us might be used in the future regardless of whether you trust current society, current governments or not. We really need to realize that data 
that we allow to be collected today is permanently stored for any future government to pick over at any time, or any future hacker, or any future hostile nation who wants to use this data against citizens of another country, or any future terrorist group, or any future president turned autocrat who decides that he or she has a dislike for a certain sector of, of society. So we can make no guarantees about our civil, civil liberties in the future, even if we trust the leadership of a country today. So laws can change overnight. I don't want to get political, like I don't care if you agree with the laws or not, right? Any law could change overnight and these sudden legal shifts can instantly transform law-abiding citizens into criminals. So what if end-to-end -end encryption were banned overnight? It's not entirely off the table right now. What about cryptocurrency? If that was suddenly banned overnight, what about certain political views? So a cursory glance at history shows us countless instances of complete loss of freedom due to shifted social norms and civil liberties. In Hong Kong, 2020, China imposed its national security law, which granted authorities broad powers to crack down on dissent. It was once considered by many think tanks to be one of the most free places in the world. And it had this strong protest culture, but this law resulted in the immediate suppression of speech, particularly of political expression, and led to the arrest of pro-democracy activists, the disbandment of political opposition parties, and the closure of independent media outlets. And it happened so quickly. The Iranian Revolution in 1979 led to the establishment of an Islamic Republic with a rapid change in societal norms and personal freedoms all within a single year. And women in particular lost many of their rights. The construction of the Berlin Wall, 1961, separated East Berlin from West Berlin overnight, and it resulted in the immediate loss of freedom for over a million people, including freedom to travel, speech, assembly, association, economic activity. And those trapped in East Berlin had to ensure this situation for 28 years. So the dangers of data permanence in a world where societal norms and laws are constantly changing is a real threat. Because this data might be used by any government or entity in the future for any reason of their choosing. And we should keep in mind the surveillance asymmetry of modern digital era. There is a great video by Slovenian political scientist Samo Burža where he explains how the internet has made us far more visible to governments and large corporations, but it has not made governments and large corporations more visible to us. And this information asymmetry is crucial for control. When corporations and governments collect large amounts of data about us, it inherently creates a power imbalance. And at their core, governments and organizations are made up of people. The resulting concentration of power risks being misused by individuals within these entities against those in more vulnerable positions. And we already see examples of this imbalance of power being uh, abused by individuals where the surveillance put into the back doors of our lives can harm people just as much as it's trying to protect people. Instances like the officer in Kentucky who used his insider access to law enforcement back doors to hack people's Snapchat accounts and extort women with nude photos or intelligence workers who use their privileged access of surveillance tools to spy on romantic interests. It's apparently common enough that the term love int was coined to describe it. And now maybe these cases are few and far between, and overwhelmingly in free countries, data isn't being weaponized. And let's again, for argument's sake, let's just presume that this is the case. As the builders in this room envision and create innovative tools built upon the internet, we need to think hard about the future that we're enabling. And relying on hope that the wrong individuals won't access our systems is not a robust safety strategy. Likewise, we can't just hope that data we're collecting remains benign while legal landscapes and societal norms keep changing around us. Instead, it is essential that we focus on fortifying what we build to safeguard the balance of power and protect individual freedoms. So now I want to explore the psychological effects of pervasive surveillance. And while these effects might be less overt than the other risks we've discussed, they're no less significant. There are popular archetypal examples of pervasive surveillance that we can look at to help illustrate the deep impact that it has on society. So Orwell's 1984, wonderful example there. And it paints this chilling picture of a world drowning in fear and paranoia. And citizens are always under the threat of surveillance from these telescreens and from ThinkPole. And they risk punishment for any unorthodox beliefs or sentiments. 
But there is another illustrative model that we can look to, the panopticon. And how it works is there's this circular prism with the central watchtower, and there's only one guard. And he can't possibly watch everyone all at once, but the prisoners have no idea whom he is watching. So it gives them this feeling of constant surveillance, and so the prisoners start to regulate their own behavior just in case the guard happens to be watching. Now, putting aside, again, the dramatic flair of these two symbols, both 1984 and the Panopticon underscore the profound power of ever-present surveillance in molding human behavior. Most of us have an instinctive understanding about the surveillance and data collection around us. Even if we can't explicitly detail the extent or the methods of this monitoring, its ever-presence creates crucial changes in behavior. First and probably most obviously, constant surveillance creates a chilling effect, stifling of free speech, thought and action due to fear of retribution. When people feel like they're being watched or monitored, they're less likely to express their opinions or engage in activism, especially if it's controversial or against mainstream opinion. Without private communication, agitation and pushback against authoritarianism becomes impossible. As privacy advocate Juan Angel put in his essay, Privacy, the Hill to Die On, life in the panopticon of absolute digital surveillance forces humans to become shells of themselves, subjects who self-censor their own thoughts, behaviors, and expressions, even in private interactions. But along with internet surveillance and collection of our data, a fundamental shift has happened to do with the permanency of our actions. Our interactions with people, they used to be largely ephemeral. We'd see people in person, we'd wave hi, that moment's lost forever in time. Our conversations, our mistakes, our private moments were mostly fleeting. And they were remembered only by those present and often they were altered by the passage of time or the fallibility of memory. But now in the digital age, a digital specter follows us around. Our every utterance, every search, every like or share has the potential to be catalogued, analyzed and remembered. And this takes the ephemeral and it makes it last forever. In pre-internet times, people could grow, they could evolve. And they could even reinvent themselves over the years. Mistakes or beliefs from our past did not necessarily haunt us for life. But with every action, statement and thought being collected and recorded in the digital age, it becomes more difficult for individuals to evolve beyond their past. The consequences of our past opinions and beliefs etched permanently online gives rise to this permanent self instead of us being living, breathing, narrative shaped in real time. And when things we say become permanent, there's a tendency to become defensive about them instead of being open-minded. Admitting to change in our beliefs might seem like a weakness in the face of ever-present digital history. And knowing that our actions are constantly monitored and recorded can make us refrain from exploring new ideas or questioning the status quo because we fear potential repercussions or judgment based on our digital trail. With every digital action being scrutinized, there's a subtle push towards conformity. It becomes safer to follow the herd than to stand out or challenge prevailing norms. And this leads to a society that values uniformity over individual thought. This newfound digital shadow haunts us. Instead of spontaneous expressions or genuine searches for knowledge, we might lean towards actions that look better in our digital profile. There is this subtle internalization that our digital self is in some way more important than our real self. In a world like this, authenticity becomes scarce, replaced by curated personalities for digital consumption. And these are profound shifts in the collective psyche of society that we need to be aware of. And I think they're important enough that we should start pushing back against normalizing the surveillance of our innermost worlds. So let's recap where we've come so far. In the modern digital world, we're under constant surveillance. We know that. This affects us psychologically in subtle but profound ways. Constant surveillance also has the potential to threaten our free society because laws change, social norms change, but data collected about us is forever and we don't know how this data will be used in the future. So with all of this in mind, we can no longer afford to keep ignoring the importance of privacy in our lives. The internet may have started without keeping privacy in mind, but it should not continue that way. So how do we actually protect our privacy better in the digital age? This is the final part of the talk that I wanna focus on. The people in this room are the developers and contributors building the future of the internet. 
So you're part of companies and projects that facilitate the online activities of countless people. And it's all of you who in large part get to determine how much surveillance is able to take place. So the mass surveillance of today, it largely depends on individuals freely giving over their data to companies and not realizing that they're giving over their data to companies. So people naturally think, okay, so individuals need to be convinced to stop doing that. Let's just reach out to 7 billion people. We'll get all of them to change their mind. But rather than trying to shift the behavior of billions of people, it's far more impactful for those building the tools of the internet to start prioritizing privacy instead. So after the 2013 Snowden revelations highlighted vulnerabilities in data transmission and the extent of government surveillance that was going on, a tremendous shift happened in the internet at that time. But it did not come from individuals reading these reports and changing their habits, nor really from the adoption of better laws. It was the tech industry's response that completely changed the landscape of digital privacy. So internet traffic, although already on a trajectory towards greater encryption, experienced an accelerated shift from being around 30% encrypted in transit pre-Snowden to an estimated 80% encrypted in transit just a few years later. And major companies like Google and Apple intensified the call for robust encryption. And they were the ones who led the way for a huge uptick in the adoption of encryption protocols. When WhatsApp added end-to-end -end encryption to their messaging app, they turned on privacy for a billion people. The impact of this was huge. It was builders of internet tooling and services who created privacy shields for billions of users. And every builder in this room can make an impact by being mindful of privacy when coming up with policies, architectural designs, and implementations of all the technology that they're developing. And again, there are obvious costs to integrating privacy-minded changes into our work. But we have to realize that there are also costs to not doing so. So what kinds of changes might you think about? What might be helpful? Well, first, there's the collection side of things, right? Companies right now intentionally collect a lot of data about users. They store logs, they attach information to account profiles that include all kinds of data points about user interaction. The reason it's collected is because they can gain insight from the data. This can help them provide better services. And they also collect it because money can be made from this data. But they're focused only on the benefits of data collection and not realizing that this data collection is actually a huge liability. So companies are notoriously bad at protecting data. John Chambers, the former CEO of Cisco, once said, there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those who don't yet know they have been hacked. <laughs> So user data is leaked all the time in data breaches. And it's not just hackers that we have to be mindful of. Companies might decide down the line that they want to start selling the data that they've been collected to data brokers. And you'll have no control at all over this decision. Or it might be demanded by governments that seek to do harm to someone. Again, you'll have no control. You may have implemented or set up a system that collects that data in the first place. You're not going to be able to control what happens to that data down the line. So there's an assumption that many companies should just by default collect any data available. But many are increasingly realizing that it is irresponsible to collect data that they can't adequately protect. And so they're adopting a data minimization approach where they consciously don't collect unnecessary data. So pushing for a culture at your company where only data that is needed is collected and nothing more can make a huge impact on the lived privacy of countless people. Next, let's talk encryption. If you do collect data, is that data being stored securely? At the most basic end is the data stored in clear text. And it seems ridiculous to mention that in 2024. <laughs> but remember that Equifax stored the passwords and social security numbers and sensitive information of 150 million people in clear text. But presuming that all data being amassed is encrypted, is it securely implemented? And who has access to the decryption keys. Can any employee at the company get access to this data? Protecting user data extends beyond merely preventing external breaches. It's also about managing internal access. Allowing unrestricted internal access to user data or being at all lax about this creates multiple points of failure because every employee with access becomes a potential vector for data leaks, whether inadvertently or through malicious intent. Access to user data, no matter how benign, 
that data seems should follow the basic principle of least privilege. So as few people as necessary should ever be able to access this consumer data. So if you're in a position to make sure that user data is being protected the best way possible, again, that's somewhere where you can make a huge difference. And there are tools for anonymization and pseudonymization, disguising data to protect identity. This is tremendously powerful if you do have that data that you need to store. Exploring how you might use such methods in your work allows you to utilize valuable data sets for analysis and innovation without compromising individual privacy. And then we get to the really exciting territory with the real world applications of homomorphic encryption that are starting to be explored. So the promise behind homomorphic encryption is that we can do computations on encrypted data without first needing to decrypt it. And this is groundbreaking for privacy. It allows services to provide all kinds of tools for users without ever seeing the data in its raw, unencrypted form. Users can store encrypted data in the cloud, run computations on it directly without ever having to decrypt it, which would ensure that data remains private even if a cloud provider is compromised. Patients' medical data can be encrypted and used in uh, research computations without ever exposing individual medical records. There are applications in banks and financial institutions, private voting systems, secure data mar marketplaces, machine learning, especially when training with sensitive data. There are so many ways that this will revolutionize the privacy landscape, but none of this is really a reality yet. Homomorphic encryption is computationally intensive and it can be slower than traditional methods. We've moved past the purely th theoretical stage of this technology, but real world applications are still limited with just a few early stage deployments and proof of concepts emerging. So another thing that privacy conscious people can push for is continued research into this area. If you're at a company that might be able to support that work, maybe this is something you could look into. Having more people working on this encryption technology can steamroll it from its current developmental phase into something used in everyday applications. Next, many companies keep users as uninformed as possible about what kind of data is collected from them and how it's used, when it's shared, how securely it's stored. And this is often by design. Too often privacy policies are written as a form of liability insurance instead of educating users. Explanations are hidden behind 60 pages of legalese instead of being clearly explained in a way that users can actually understand. And I think there's an ethical responsibility to users to make sure the policies are clear about when data is collected. So it's important that people really understand what agreements they're entering into and that companies respect their users enough to allow them to make informed decisions about whether they want to use certain products or services. So if you can help shift culture around privacy to one where users are more informed about the practices going on, that would make a huge impact on the privacy trajectory. You can also shift culture by looking at the internal practices of your organization, by adopting more private communication methods. Developers can reinforce a culture where privacy is a paramount concern. And by supporting privacy-focused platforms and open source privacy tools, we can support the work that is currently being done to protect privacy. And we can also send a market signal that this work is valuable, which in turn helps to spur investment and development in this space if you have the skill set, you might even consider contributing to some of the open source privacy tools out there in your spare time. It's just something to keep in mind. And by adding to the anonymity set of privacy tools by using them, we can actually make these tools even more robust. The more people who use privacy enhancing technologies, the harder it becomes to single out individual users. So even if we ourselves feel that maybe we're not in a vulnerable position, we can help the most vulnerable people in our societies who do rely on these privacy tools to stay safe. So making that switch is actually more important than you may realize. And all of this importantly fosters an environment where privacy is the norm rather than the exception, which helps maintain privacy awareness and commitment among peers. So every time I attend a hacker conference, I feel like I am amidst the vanguard of digital innovation because the people here understand that the internet is as much a beacon of enlightenment as it is a potential tool for surveillance. And we just simply can't ignore the dual nature of the internet any longer or rely on people's goodwill to not abuse this surveillance. That is not a robust measure for safeguarding our digital future. As we navigate through an internet brimming with personal data, the innovators here 
hold an extraordinary power, the power to embed privacy into the very fabric of the platforms that you are creating. The fact that a single company can give billions of people access to private communications with the flip of a switch is a testament to how all of us can make a difference. So what switches can you flip at the places where you work? And there's also the cultural impact. We have the ability to push back against complacency. Let's empower people to create positive change and let's stop normalizing pervasive surveillance. So the people in this room are uniquely positioned to play a huge role in the direction that our digital future will take. And every line of code, every infrastructure choice, every innovation can not only push the boundaries of what's technologically possible, but can also uphold the fundamental right to privacy for billions of people across the globe. So as we craft the web's future, let's not just innovate, let's protect. Every decision that we make can be a step towards a more private, safer internet for all. Thank you so much. So we've got time for questions. I don't think there's a microphone, but you're welcome to stand and shout at me because I'm used to people doing that, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that's important. I, I mainly focused on what like developers can do in changing infrastructure, in changing systems that billions of people use. Uh, but there is a whole other side that this gentleman focused on, which is the user side. And overwhelmingly, people voluntarily give up their data. You know, how many people, like put your hand up if you use Gmail. Yeah, I know some of you are afraid to put your hand up. I'm watching you. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we, again, it's 2024. We just don't need to be using a service that literally in its privacy policy says that it is analyzing every single email that we send to someone, every single document we put in the cloud. Every aspect of their service, uh, services is analyzed and it's used to build this profile because ultimately companies like Google are advertising companies. You are not their customer, you are their product. Their customers are advertising uh, companies. And so they're packaging you up through all of this data you're voluntarily feeding them. So I think on an individual level, just making the switch from tools like Gmail to, I don't know, pick a private email of choice. There's so many, you've got ProtonMail, Tutanota. Find something that will end-to-end -end encrypt emails, between users on a platform, they will store it with zero access encryption, encrypted with your private key, so that even they can't get access to the contents of that email. Just make that switch. The good thing about GDPR, I know it's like this strange privacy rule that's arbitrarily enforced a lot of the time, but one thing to come out of it is that Google was forced to expose a lot of APIs to the public. And the result of that is you can literally go into ProtonMail, click one button that says import your entire email contacts, and you can switch your entire email over to a private provider that's going to respect you as a user. That seems like a really easy thing people can immediately be doing. So if you, you know, want to do one thing as a takeaway leaving this talk, maybe just do that. They also have encrypted calendars. How much data is revealed about us for our calendar, from our complete history of where we've ever been, the people that we've connected with. We have their contacts written in there. Google's getting all of that and mapping all of these social graphs accordingly. So use an encrypted calendar. Again, Proton uh, has a great encrypted calendar. Not a sponsor of the talk, just a good tool you should look into. But there are countless tools. You know, are you using SMS? Are you voluntarily handing over your data? Because we know that there are lawful uh, data access laws all over the world, not just in the United States. Every country in the world has lawful access, uh, access laws for communications channels. So they're not legally allowed to encrypt telecommunication channels but you can encrypt packages and put them in those telecommunication channels, right? So you could use something like Signal instead of SMS, which encrypts your messages and then puts it into this data stream and sends it around. So like if you're using SMS, they can absolutely be intercepted, not just by the telecommun company, telecommunications company itself, uh, but intercepted by rogue actors, although that is more difficult these days than it used to be. Um, but 
it, like you, we just shouldn't be giving access to our private communications to anyone that way. If you're using Facebook Messenger, if you're using I know, Telegram, and you don't understand that Telegram does not end-to-end -end encrypt your messages by default, I mean, you're making choices that voluntarily hand over a huge amount of data, and you can, as individuals, be making better choices. And there are so many, there's so much low-hanging fruit where the transition cost is nothing, you know, switching from Chrome browser, which is collecting every single thing you do, to something like Brave browser, or perhaps you use Firefox and tweak all the settings to harden it. Whatever your browser of choice is, it probably should not be Chrome. Uh, you're just, again, voluntarily handing over data, and these days, alternative browsers are so great, there, there's just no cost to switching. So that's a very long answer. I just yeah, go into a rant. So um, anyone else have any questions? Um. There are so many people who say, I just don't worry about it because I don't have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best response to somebody who doesn't think they have anything to hide? Yeah, I think that we need to make a distinction between understanding the value of privacy as an essential part of preserving a free society and thinking that we ourselves don't have anything to hide because they're fundamentally two different concepts. So let's just look at you know the foundation of privacy for a second we all instinctually understand that like again go to some authoritarian regime get out of your comfort zone where you're privileged enough to you know have surveillance used as a tool of oppression against you let's go to a different country where you're not allowed to protest against the government where you're not allowed to say anything bad against the government where you're not allowed to say anything bad against the warlords who you know uh, control your your region maybe you're not allowed to write anything in the press that is critical maybe you have to just be the mouthpiece of the state in the country where you are, whatever it is. And then let's say maybe you're someone who wants to make a difference in that country. How are you meant to do that with pervasive surveillance? How are you meant to, you know, uh, aggregate with, with other people and put together plans and fight to make your lives better if there's pervasive surveillance? And we see that in a lot of countries it's just not possible for people to do this because surveillance is just so pervasive. It, it's just so... It's so terrible. So we understand the principle of why privacy is essential for a free society, because people need to be able to communicate privately to push back against authoritarian regimes without fear of retribution. So given that, when you hear people say, I have nothing to hide, first of all, I feel like they're just virtue signaling. They're just like, well, I'm a really good person. And like, essentially what they're doing is they're saying, well, me and the people with guns are always going to be on good terms. I was like, what kind of a bet is that to make? You have no idea what laws are going to be you know, hatched down the line. And you're making a bet that you're always going to be on the government side? I know. I think we have a history of really terrible governments all over the world who institute really bad policies. So if you're someone who's like, I have nothing to hide because I'm always going to toe the line and, and you know, just follow mainstream thought and, you know, do whatever authoritarian regimes tell me, even when maybe morally I know it's bad, but, like, I'm not going to step out of line or try to make a difference. You're saying a lot about yourself there. So I feel that People who share this rhetoric, I have nothing to hide, this doesn't affect me. First of all, I don't respect these people because I just, like, it's someone who's like, I never want to be an activist. Well, all right, cool, you do you. Um, but on the other side of things, I think it comes from a very privileged position. I think that it's someone who is just lucky enough to live in a society where pervasive surveillance is not used to subjugate them. And unfortunately, there are billions of people all over the world for whom it, life is not so easy. So that's great that they're not willing to participate in the privacy anonymity set because they feel really nice and secure in their bubble. Me personally, I want to make the world more private for everyone. So yes, I'm going to be using these, I'm going to be using Tor even though I'm only looking at, I don't know, Instagram cat videos or whatever. Like I'm going to be using the tools that are going to help these people who are the most vulnerable people in society stay safer because I see the work that they're trying to do to make their future better and I want to give them a fighting chance. And they're not going to have a fighting chance if, like, only three people are using Signal and they're one of them. Like, you know, we all need to be jumping into these privacy tools to help the most vulnerable people. So that's, that's the response I would, I would give. Mm -hmm. yeah. If nothing else, we need to live up to the title private citizen. Yeah, private citizen. It's like this interesting inversion that happened, right? You, you used to have, like, you know, public 
servant and private citizen and somewhere along the line governments get more and more opaque and then the lives of citizens get more and more transparent i think that's dangerous uh, even if you're feeling safe in you know your current situation you don't want to set up a system where that imbalance of power is only going in one direction and one side accumulates more and more of it and the other side their lives have just become more and more open and vulnerable so yeah it's definitely worth keeping in mind Proton mail and signal, both use end to end encryption, but they are in the clear on my end at each of my hardware devices. Mm -hmm. And we all know that much, but many of us haven't heard and don't know about self destructing options that each of those have in them. Would you address your opinion on using those self address, those self destruct options, and depend on that? Yeah, I think that this weird thing happened in the digital age where because now we have these digital artifacts, we kind of want to hoard them. Like, who has looked over any of their past photos, like, recently? <laughs> like, what about that fireworks display you went to? Did you go through those fireworks photos and watch them again? Like, I mean, I feel like we collect all this stuff and it just kind of sits there and we keep it for some reason, just in case. And that's a weird change in society, because again, we used to have these ephemeral interactions, we used to have fleeting conversations, they disappear. Now, you know, we meet someone online, we have our entire romance over text message, and it stays there in perpetuity. And, and you know, we, we somehow want to keep that. But I think we need to realize that all the data that we we hoard is a liability to us, right? If we are just keeping a history of, of everything we've ever said, sometimes it can be useful. I can definitely see use cases, but I, I actually think that people need to kind of let go of that idea um, just for their health. <laughs> I mean, that's a choice you guys can make. I'm definitely not gonna be like, guys, delete all your messages. But I personally find that like, self-destructive messages are fantastic. Um, also because if you're, you've ever been friends with someone and they're involved in a court case, you understand that discovery process means that they have to hand over the entire contents of their SMS history or whatever. If you're using Signal and everything deletes after four weeks, it's like a good amount of time. So four weeks, if you need to go back and see something, it's there. But anything past that, it's deleted. And I just think that if you don't want your private conversations ending up in public discovery because your friend happened to be involved in some legal dispute, it's probably something you should start thinking about. You know, just how can we... How can we safeguard our own lives by not creating this target on our back, not creating this, this liability? Does that uh, process that Signal uses, like the whole four-week like, message destroying like, yeah. mechanism, does that work as well as Snapchat? Because I know they have like the whole deleting thing, but I'm like, do they still keep track of that stuff? Uh -huh. they say it deletes after 24 hours? Snapchat. Yeah. Let's talk about Snapchat. Like, I so Snapchat's so interesting. There, if you like Google, or let's, let's stop using that word, god damn. If you brave search uh, Snapchat end-to-end -end encryption, you'll get a bunch of articles from about like four years ago talking about their plans in the future to add end-to-end -end encryption down the pipeline. It's vague, but it's like a big announcement. So it's like, okay, cool. So Snapchat's private, right? If you scour their privacy policy, you won't see end-to-end -end encryption mentioned once. And you have to click through all this rabbit hole of, okay, click on our see more of our privacy policy. All right, I'll click on see more of the privacy policy. Click here if you want even more information. It's like, oh, okay, uh, I'll click here. Like, click on this other thing and see our glossary. And, I, and, it's, and it's a maze. And I've dived into Snapchat so many times. So no text messages on Snapchat are end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, so your conversations, uh, group chats, private messages are not end-to-end -end encrypted, so keep that in mind. Um, your pictures, I mean, <laughs> they ostensibly photos between people are end-to-end -end encrypted. I'll say that with a bit of a caveat there. One, it's closed source, so we really can't know what's happening, but, and it doesn't say anywhere on their website about that. It's just kind of looking through things that have talked about this that suggests that they are. Um, but they also have all these backdoor tools. Uh, they have something called Snap Lion, which is like a law enforcement tool that's actually been abused by workers before, uh, who've you know, used it to exfiltrate photos of people. So it's like, if it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and you have these backdoor tools, and you're able to get pictures, 
is, I mean, how is that working? So it, Snapchat's like a whole, like, muddly, shadowy thing. If you're trying to find a private messenger, definitely don't use it. If you want to send deleting photos, honestly, use Signal. Right? Because you can literally change the, there's a little icon on signal for pictures that says view once only. You can see that video, that picture once and it deletes. And that's not stored on anyone's servers. So you talked about changing culture within organizations. So I'm kind of curious, for people who are in a position like me, who's at like an entry level engineer um, position and don't really have a lot of influence, where you should begin, you know, especially when you see things going wrong, policy-wise with privacy in organizations, like beginning that culture change for somebody who lacks influence of, you know, managerial positions? I think that's a, a hugely important question. Um, and I think even if you're not working for a company, how do you just change this culture of privacy? And human beings are herd animals. We really do like to fit in with our peers. If we can just start normalizing these tools, it does make a difference. All of my friends know that if they want to get hold of me, I am not going to respond on Instagram. Like maybe I'll look at it in six months' time and be like, oh, I have 755 messages on here. I'm not going to respond to everyone, anyone. And they know that. They know if they want to get hold of me, they use signals. So if you can just start small within your local group and suddenly you're normalizing, hey, we prioritize privacy. That starts to spread. That starts to bleed into other areas. So really just, you know, not, you don't even have to make a big deal of it. You don't even need to be accusatory. Again, I understand the costs of switching things up and implementing better policies, and businesses are very much aware of this stuff. They're factoring this in when they're making decisions, probably not factoring it in enough in terms of the downside of losing privacy. But I think that, that just starting small and normalizing privacy, reminding people that privacy is normal, it's not the exception, it, this is the rule, this is the default, I think can go a long way because that spreads and then you start to say, okay, well, we have a choice here about which way we're going to go. Well, privacy is important, right? Or maybe we'll err on that side. And so just growing up from there, I think, can be really powerful just, again, by starting from your local network. How do you feel about uh, how we're slowly kind of transforming into like a cashless society? So like every debit, you know, so, like how do you combat like the convenience of Venmo? And you know they're tracking it even if it's encrypted because they use it for like IRS purposes and stuff like that. So it's like, like is there any way to go against the cashless like society? And, like, oh like, gosh, this is such a good question. Yeah. All right, so. We have this weird situation right now where we, again, have normalized pervasive surveillance when it comes to finance. We're like, yeah, my private messages are private, but of course everyone needs access to all of my financial choices. This didn't used to be the case. 1970, the Bank Secrecy Act came in and said, listen, let's, we're just doing this little thing. It's just $10,000 cash reporting requirements, right? And this was challenged as unconstitutional at the time. They were like, what? You can't just mandate that everyone who makes a purchase over $10,000 has to hand in their financial data. Like, we literally have the Fourth Amendment for a reason. You can't have overbearing searches and seizures. People have the right to privacy. And this went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, we agree completely, this is unconstitutional, but $10,000 is such an overwhelmingly large, life-changing amount of money in 1970 that this really isn't a problem, but they had the caveat, if things change, then, you know, inflation, all of that, maybe we'll reassess. And it's now 2024, we have never reassessed that. To give you an idea of how much $10,000 bought you in, in 1970, that was, that was a house. That was a brand new house, right? So this is insane. So yeah, of course, today, if you and spent all cash on like a $600,000 house or whatever, then maybe the government would be like, ah, oh, this seems fishy. But what's happened is we lose our purchasing power year after year, and it just becomes more and more normalized that, yes, people have the right to see all of our financial data, and it's just not okay. And I just push back against that culturally. I try and pay with cash everywhere I can, just out of out of principle, you know? It's annoying. I, someone, one of my friends remarks like, Naomi, you take pictures of your receipts and have to do things manually. I just pay with my card and it automatically gets uploaded to my accountant. You know, why are you doing this? And I'm doing it because I don't think that these companies have the rights to just be looking at every single thing I'm doing. And I'm not doing anything wrong. Like, I, I don't know, I'm buying anime or whatever I'm doing. Like, it doesn't matter. But I just feel like I have the right to make decisions that other people are not privy to.
too. And so cash is great, but it is disappearing. We are, you know, seeing the advent of CBDC being explored, which is going to completely transition us to a cashless society. I ran out of time. So the last thing I will say is in the digital world, cash just doesn't really work anymore. You can't use cash on the internet. So what do you do? I encourage you to start looking into different cryptocurrencies. And I know that there are people who'll be like, it's all a scam, it's all a Ponzi. It's also the best option for digital privacy that we have. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin, which is completely transparent on public ledgers. I'm talking about coins that implement zero knowledge proofs. I'm talking about things like, I mean, look into Zcash, Monero, Fero. Like there are a ton of things, Railgun for Ethereum. Like just start looking at it. It's a learning curve. But honestly, in a future where all we have are CBDCs or our cards and cash is just disappearing, if you value your privacy, this is going to be something that you will eventually have to start implementing in your life. So that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, everyone.